Hello and welcome to today's session, Scoli for Kids, at Global Point of View Forum, Food Legacy International. This month is the International Women's Month, and it's my favorite month. We need to celebrate this month and remember our ancestors with gratitude for all the work they've done to make everything possible for us women today. And we need, as a human, to continue their work to make more beautiful things possible to the next generations to come. Also, this month is my birthday, so that's another reason to be happy with March. Let me introduce myself. I am Najla Ansaleti. I am PFP alumni. PFP is Freshman Program Fellows Program, and I joined the PFP family in 2018, and that was one of the best experiences I had in my life. I am a electrical engineer, that's my bachelor degree, and recently I have earned my master's, which is dual degree in education management, also in uh, information technology of management. And this dual degree makes sense to my personalities and my passion, where I'm really passionate about education and technology as well. Growing up, I've always loved science, math, and technology, and I always had a curious mind. I always wanted to see how things work. I would break everything I have just to see the way they operate. And I started my career in, uh, in the research and technology field with a company in Libya called Tatware. And the environment of the company allowed me to explore more and learn more about what I love and what I do not love. And working with Tatware also helped me realize that I am really passionate about education and want to try my best to enhance and improve the education system in Libya. And that's why I started my own NGO, Nonprofit She Codes, which is it's a Libya-based nonprofit. And we aim to teach women and kids how to code. And we try our best to help in bridging the gap in the technology. And we try to focus at Chico's at teaching kids computational thinking and the skills that they need in this time, which is technology based, and the future, where it's, we really think it's going to be more tech centralized future. So we need to teach them skills and way of thinking that would help them. We do not teach them just a programming language because that will change with time. By the time they graduate and they want to find a job, that programming language they learned, it's expired. So we teach them the concept of how to understand how machines work and how to communicate with them because we really aim to make children our active learner instead of passive consumers. And this is what the session is about, teaching kids code computational thinking and uh, the benefit of it. In today's session, we're going to talk about what is computational thinking and what are the concepts of computational thinking and then what's the impact of teaching computational thinking on children. Also, I'll share with you one of, um, not one, a few of resources and tools that I personally use at Cheat Codes and saw an amazing impact on children from it. Also, we're going to talk about a topic that's very important, which is e-safety. And we're going to talk about the mental health aspect of it, also the cyberbullying aspect of it. And then we're just going to close up the session and start our live Q&A session. So what is competential thinking? Competential thinking is, is a problem-solving process that includes multiple characteristics and dispositions. What does that mean? So there's a lot of misconception or confusion between the terminology of coding or programming or computational thinking. These two are not the same thing. So programming is it's actually implementing whatever the computational thinking prepare you to. So in other words, computational thinking is when you have a problem and you start planning and how solving it, you want to look at the problem as a as a whole and then decompose it to a smaller steps and then collect all of your data and then think of how you're gonna solve that problem. And then once you have the plan ready, this is where the programming steps comes in. So and we do that in, in our daily activities. For example, when let's say you wanna go to a bakery. So in this bakery, it's a new bakery in a new area, you've never been there. So before getting out of the house, you probably want to plan things first. So you want to start collecting your data in terms of 
what is the weather gonna look like? Uh, what time I have to be there? How long is the distance? What does the menu look like? Do, like, do I need to get cash or do they accept credit cards? And then you would look at, the, at your own schedule. Maybe you have something else that you have to do as well. Like maybe you need to pick your dry cleaner. So you wanna choose the road that leads to the dry cleaner. And by that you hit two, two birds with one stone. Also, you want to see like do you want the road the less traffic or the shortest one? It depends. So you collect all of this data and then sort of like taking it step by step. Get ready. Get cash out. Get in the car. Start driving. Pick up the dry cleaning. So all of that like the steps, organizing the steps in the right order. That's what we call algorithm. So there is a there is a cons concepts of computational thinking. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. So we're going to use, in explaining the concept of uh, CT, we're going to use the same example of going to the Petri. So the first thing we're going to think about is collecting the data. And as I said previously, collecting the data in terms of the weather, the budget, the roads, maybe your personal tasks, all of that, I'm collecting all the data that's going to help me make my plan. And then the second thing, I'm going to analyze my data. Oh, the weather is going to be snowy, so maybe I wouldn't take that road, I would take this road instead. Or they only accept cash, so I would need to make sure it's either I grab cash from the house or stop by the ATM machine and grab some cash. So this is how I'm analyzing data. Also, I need to look for a pattern. Saying, for example, this bakery, it's a new place. So you want to look at the distance. Oh, it's like four miles away. So previous on your experience, how long usually four miles takes you? How much gas that will, re will require? And we try to find like pattern or previous links to previous experience that can help me make a better decision. And then from that, we're gonna, there's another step that's not applied in every situation, but it's data representation, which is visualization of the data using charts or graphs. It depends on what the problem you're trying to solve. And then from here comes the problem decomposition. And here, as I said, you're gonna break it down to simple steps to understand it. And then abstraction is one of the main uh, concept of CT. And abstraction is, means that we're gonna focus only on the relevant data. Because when we start the data collection, there's gonna be a lot of factors and we need to learn how to ignore all irrelevant data. And then from that, after we have all of our data and we broke down the problem, now we can design our algorithm and procedures. Now we can design our steps. And that is very important in terms of dealing with computers because computers are not smart as a human is. So you can tell someone, I will meet you at a bakery. And if they see that road is closed, by default, they're going to take the next road. They're going to solve that by themselves. But when you're going to talk with a laptop, with a computer and programming language, you need to give them everything in precise and details and the right order. And you need to give them the loops. If that happens, you need to do ABC. If that happens, you need to do ABC. Because again, computers are not smart. and once we're dealing with computers and technology, we need to understand how it operates. And that's why it's important to teach our kids how to use and understand the concept of machines and data and computers. Because we don't want them to just have a lot of thinking it's, it's genius and this is magic and one click it does ABC. We need them to understand subconsciously and use it with attention that they know that clicking the power button, that means the laptop will turn on. If I do this, that means the laptop will take a command and transfer it into an action. And there's a lot of there's a lot of benefits of teaching kids about CT, and that's what I'm gonna talk about next. So when we teach children about computational thinking, we actually teach them skills that the child will be more tolerance to um, ambiguity. They're not gonna be scared from problems. Their attitude towards problems is gonna be changed. It's gonna change. And from experience, I've seen children at the first few sessions, when they're faced with a challenge, they would get stuck and then they would get, some of them get even angry and frustrated and start asking for help right away. Like, hey miss, can you please figure out why my laptop doesn't work? 
well, I'm trying to tell my avatar to do so and so, but it refuses to. So what we do is instead of giving them the answer, we try to help them reflect on that, asking them, what do you think the problem is? How do you think you can solve it? How do you think we can help the avatar? And the child will start coming up with solution themselves. And so we, we just guide them to dig deep because they know the solution and we need to make them aware that they did that themselves. And then once they solve the problem themselves, we actually remind them saying, see, you didn't need my help. You were able to do that by yourself. And then the look at their face, just amazing. And then after a few sessions, I would notice the same children or students, they would come and be asking for the miss, but for a different reason. They want to show off their skills, show off their skills, and they would say, oh miss, look at that, I, my other child did not want to do what I wanted to do, but then when I looked into it, I found the problem is ABC, and I was able to solve it by doing so and so and so. And that's just amazing. I mean, think about making the child more independent. And when facing the challenges in life, they're gonna be able to look at the problem, start breaking it down, simple enough, and the simple steps enough that they can solve it and start collecting the data, looking for a pattern, what's going on here? How am I gonna solve it? Like, what's my best approach? Also, another thing is, and we saw that a lot of our sessions, is the children start asking themselves, each other for help, like teamwork. So a child, had figured out that part of the game and the other one is so good at organizing the steps for example or writing down their challenges so they start asking each other like hey how did you figure that out and they have amazing ways of figuring things out and us as an adult we actually do not see it the way they do they get more creative and that's good because that's what competition is all about exploring their creativity and motivate them to do more and believe in their ability and just look at the thing whatever the problem is whatever the, the big picture is and be able to break it down break it down to enough steps that would make sense to them and that honestly there's a lot of benefits of competition thinking but these are the main that from experience i've seen with my own eyes within just few sessions in so you can see here, I'm sharing two pictures, they're from She Codes, and in these two pictures you can see that the children are actually collaborating, teamwork, they're asking each other what do you think, how we're gonna put that together, and the devices they're using, they're one of the tools and resources, and I will talk about the devices. So the Canoe Kit, is, it's so good to teach children about computers, because instead of giving the students a ready computer and try to explain to them and using their imagination to try to figure out what the laptop is made of, it's better if we just give them an assembled kit and say, you need to use this laptop, but you need to put it together first. So that way they start putting, oh, this is the memory, this is the power, this is the operator, and we need this because this is what we're gonna use it for. So they actually, they start putting it together and then they turn on the computer and now they learn the hardware they know what's made of they can see what's made of they build a computer now at this point they already feel powered they feel so powerful like superheroes and they feel so excited about learning more and building their own games so these are the tools and resources that i personally use and i actually recommend that if you are interested in teaching your child or students, that there's just there's a few free sources here that you can take a look at, but also there's stuff that you need to purchase. So I'm gonna start with the hardware. So I already explained about Canoe Kit, and the Canoe Kit, again, I cannot recommend it enough. And then there's the Beebots. The Beebots is actually, it helps a child understand algorithm the most. For example, like one of the exercises that we use when we teach with Bbots and Bbots, I use it with Tupperware Research Company. So we would ask the children to draw a maze. They would actually draw the maze or draw a direction, saying you want to take your Bbots to go to the bakery, and then they would have to calculate the steps and they would have to make an estimation: how many steps I need to give the Bbot as an order to go where I want it to be, how many 
uh, forward steps, how many left and right steps that I need to give it to, to the V-Bots. And it helped them a lot as a team. And it also it helps them a lot in figuring out problems and solve these problems, identify problems and solving these problems. So one of the things that we see a lot, a lot of time happens that they would give um, more steps or less steps than the steps that it's required for the people to go with the, the child wants to go. So here we ask them, like, what do you think went wrong? And then they would stop calculating the steps and going back and they would say oh so after step number five the b-bot was supposed to go left but instead because i gave it six steps it actually went beyond the steps i wanted it went beyond the turn and that's how they sort of like breaking down the problem and they're solving it so they erase the whole memory and they stop programming again to give the people where they wanted to go so these are the two hardwares that I've used and I, I recommend. Um, there's other websites that, like for acad um, coding, acad Code Academy. Code Academy also has uh, Khan Academy. They provide a lot of tutorials for different ages. And Code.org has so many different resources and tutorial, and it's both for the educator, the parent, or the teacher, or also as a, as a as a child herself, they can go and stop playing with the code. So these resources are free and they're amazing. And honestly, they they have tons and tons of tutorials for so many different purposes. You can just click on what category you want and what the age that you want to the child is in. And as for books, I recommend these three books. And one of them, Coding as a playground, it's so good for kids under seven years old. So if your child is under seven years old and you want to learn how to sort of uh, you teach them how to use the Scratch or B-Bots, this book is going to help a lot. It has, uh, it has already like ready steps, it's easy to go, easy to read and it provides a lot of good materials inside of it. There's the scratch was very famous and there's scratch is for the older kids and there's junior scratch which is for five years old and so on it's children and these both are so easy and it's drag drop coding so they would have to if they want their avatar to go from a to z they would have to drag the orders and put it like you can see the picture next to next to the cat face the blog looks like that like this is how you drag them and put them uh, under each other it has to be in the right order otherwise the avatar would not do what the child wants it to do also there is alice and alice is so good for if you're interested in teaching 3d printing and visualization and it also for you can use it as an educator but also you can use it as a student and Tinker has a lot of resources as well and it's for different ages and all these resources are easy to navigate and I highly recommend them also I will be publishing a blog soon, blog soon so I would have all of these listed in details for what age and how to use them and all of that now we're gonna go to the heavy stuff a safety it's, I'm 100% advocate for teaching children how to code and introduce them to technology because this is the future and we need to prepare them for their future and we cannot just uh, rely on the old methods uh, of teaching we need to speak their language come at their level but with that being said I am against throwing the child in this world of internet and technology without the right guidance and um, supervision and with supervision I just don't mean just blogging certain websites so they wouldn't have access to that because social media and technology and internet has more of a dangerous than more danger than than we just think it has and a lot of the things I'm gonna say in the session things I probably know but it's a good reminder and even if our child will know, it's a good reminder that we keep reminding them of these facts to keep them checked in and to keep them aware of. Because sometimes if we're not aware and if we don't do things with attention and repeat the intention and repeat our self-awareness, we will find ourselves in a slippery slope. So with the A-safety session, uh, 
I'm gonna start by just presenting some data about e safety and then trying to share some recommendations, suggestions of how to handle uh, technology and internet and the negative effect of it. So this paper has been published in 2020 and it has 4,000 sample. So 4,000 young girls ages from 11, 13 to 15 participated in this uh, survey. And from the paper, they found out that the more the use of social media, the more likely these girls were opposed to self-harm, depression, or even lower self-esteem. So last year at Syracuse University, me and my team, we, uh, we surveyed 280 students and the results were shocking because 14% of the students that we served, surveyed, they said we have actually cyberbullied some other students. And the reasons behind that, it was just to show off from the friends because they thought it was funny, because they were bored. And we were actually shocked that 14% said, yeah, we cyberbully. And then when we asked other students, have you ever been bullied? 43% said, yes, I have been bullied. And most of them said they did not tell anyone because they did not want to make it worse. They just thought if they didn't talk about it, it would not be a problem. It would not be real. And the students said that it did affect their emotion state, which led to affect their academic um, results as well. So we were just shocked about the fact of going to two local different schools and out of 280, 14 said we cyberbullied, 40 said we were actually victims of cyberbullies. And teachers, they did not know, and the parents, they wouldn't even know that their kids are going through cyberbullying. So look at this uh, end of graph right here. You would see that a lot of one years old babies, they own their own tablet and they spend a lot of time using that tablet. A lot of two years old don't even need help using their phones. Their phones, they're not supposed to have phones at that age. But also you can see a lot of um, the ages four to five using a uh, tablet or phones to browse some videos or, or use Google search engine and that can be so dangerous. And the next slide, we're gonna talk about the health aspect of it. But also we're gonna look at what teenagers do when they're online. A lot of them share their, their real names, their real age, their location, video of themselves, their friends. And at the age of 11, a lot of children, they actually start commenting negative comments on other people's pages which is what cyberbullying is and all of that it just this all exposure to social media our children are left with no choice but to compare their life with this fake life they're seeing and that affects their mental health a lot as i said in the previous slide the the data was published in 220 it just says a lot of suicidal happening, a lot of depression, and that's because the social media influencers or models, they're sharing fake lives. They're sharing what it's, they're selling it to the teenagers and children as the perfect life, the perfect bodies. And that is not even real. That takes a lot of editing and it takes a lot of fakeness into it. But the children don't know that. So they start dating themselves and side of like why you don't look like that why you don't have that why you do not own these items and so we need to be aware of that and we need to keep reminding our children of the social media impact and the negative negativity and the fakeness of it so we protect the mental state and protect them from this awful world out there and in this picture you can see a lot of the health effect one of them is um eye health issues because when a child at the early stage spends a lot of time using screen time looking at devices that can damage their eyes also it can their post postures of their spine their neck all of that can have negative effect on the, on the child's health also we can see here that a lot of them would have trouble sleeping nightmares all of that from technology and the misuse of technology and social media's effect 
So there is like a few things that a parent can pay attention to to know when their child is being cyberbullied or when they're being um, going through a problem or trouble in their school. So there's four signs I'm gonna talk about today. And the first thing is if the child is so depressed or if the child get more heavy when they're off social media or when they're off their laptop or phone. Also, when they're ch constantly checking their phones and they're getting anxious about that and when the grades start dropping, that could be a factor too. So, with hands on our teenagers or children, we shouldn't just be, oh, this is this age. It's not that age. It's all the other factors that we need to pay attention to. So, if your sister, nephew, cousins, or, or your own child has been going through something, you need to try to find the pattern and you need to understand what's the cause of it. It could be cyberbullying that you can step in to help the situation, or it could be, again, the fakeness of social media and self-comparing that again you can step in and provide that child with mental support make them realize how fake that is and make them overcome whatever challenges they're, they're going through and here i'm sharing um cyber how to stop cyberbullying and for grass and there's a lot of tips so uh you can report that also, there is this website, which is an amazing website. It's called www.stopbullying.gov and you can go through this website. There's a lot of resources, tools. Uh, there's even some good tips if you want to have an awareness session at your school uh, or at your community to help children stop cyberbullying and stop that negative impact of social media. I'll give you a minute to look at it. Finally, uh, I'm going to finish up with this slide and this is the SMART concept. We can teach our kids the SMART concept which is easy. The SMART is, is stay safe in terms of don't share your information, don't share your location, do not share pictures, do not meet with anyone you don't know. Always tell an adult that you trust about what's going on in your life and who you're meeting and what type of conversation are you having and if you feel like something if, if there is a flag in your mind then that's enough sign for you to tell an adult about what's going on also the except except the a which is for accepting files so we see a lot of uh, emails or messages that tell us that you won this award or whatever happened and click this link and you will be saved or what, like whatever every, every day we get like five messages three emails that's the least and sometimes if we forget that we need to tell our children about these things they may fall for that they may click the link they may get hacked and there are awful things can happen if we do not make that small awareness in our home, in our school, in our community. Like there's simple things that we can say out loud that we can repeat and have signs posted about it. So the children will learn it consciously and subconsciously and be aware and do everything with intention. And also, which is very important part is the R. Is the information I'm seeing online is reliable? Do not believe everything you read or see. You need to check facts because this is how rumors get spread and we do not want our children to believe anything saying oh there's the scientists discover this blah 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 and if you do abc this is what's gonna happen to you or you can lose weight in two days if you follow this diet so we need to teach our children to check facts not everything and on the internet is real most of things on the internet are fake and we need to teach that to our kids and again, the T is for tell someone, it's always uh, having that open conversation and safe environment with your child or your students to make them feel comfortable enough that they can come to you for your advice or help whenever something happens with them. So thank you so much for, uh, for watching this session and I hope that you enjoyed it and at least learned one thing new. These are my information contact and I just said do not share your contact. But these are my contacts, so you can reach me out for uh, for anything on these uh, my LinkedIn, SheCodes website, Twitter, SheCodes, and uh, my email. 
and I'm so excited to see you in the, in the live session for Q&A where I'll be more than happy to answer your questions but also learn from you as well and I am sure you have stories that you can share with the, with the other participants and some recommendations that I did not mention. I would love to learn that too. And before I forget, I want to thank Legacy International for providing us this platform where we can connect and share some of our knowledge and experience. So thank you so much and looking forward to see you.